This is Gary Atensa with CNTV, and today we're in Texas. Since 2006, Nancy's List has been a love letter to the universe, an expression of profound gratitude for miraculous recovery from stage 4 cancer, and a resource for cancer patients and for those who love and care for them. I'm joined here by the clinical psychologist, founder, and executive director, Nancy. Thanks so much for joining us here today. Thank you. I'm going to start off a little bit about yourself. You were formally educated at the University of California at Berkeley. You achieved your doctorate at California Graduate School of Family Psychology. You really have spent the last three decades as a clinical psychologist, but it was the chapter that began in 2004, receiving a small amount of good news and a large portion of bad news that really has led you here today. Share with me how this journey got started for you. It's a good story. Uh, I had pain in the right side of my belly and was assuming that it was appendicitis attack. Went to my internist and she immediately examined me and sent me down for a CAT scan. I knew nothing about cancer. I knew nothing about a CAT scan. I didn't know what that was. Came back and waited and waited. And then she said, do you want the good news or the bad news? I said, the good news. And she said, uh, you don't have appendicitis. I said, terrific, thanks, bye. Ready to leave the room. And she said, no, 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 do you want the bad news? And I went, okay, what is it? And she said, you have stage four ovarian cancer, which has metastasized to your liver. And we're setting up the room for surgery right now. And I went, whoa, what is stage five? Which I didn't know. <laughs> wow. And then they said, it was wisely, well, thank goodness it isn't appendicitis. So that's how it started, and through much magic and serendipity. What, what, a, what a story that is. And like you said, I went, whoa, um, I can't imagine, but many folks out there have imagined that as well. The Internet has provided a way for many niche communities to support each other. Your community is a call to action a community. Explain why you felt this was the approach that is needed. Well, it, it's morphed into many things as, as I've evolved and it has evolved. But at the very beginning, interestingly enough, I was practicing in Mill Valley, a little town in California outside of San Francisco, and I had five women come in in one week. They didn't know each other, but they were all yogis, they all ate kale, they did everything right, and their friends were getting breast cancer, and they were flipping out. So I gathered them all together and said, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to take care of this? And what I suggested was a community call to action. That we we organize this, of course, it turned out to be a party. We organize this and identify ways that we could support the people in our community who were struggling with cancer. And there were probably 600 people at our party. And I got up and said something, it's going to take a village. And I want to build one with all of you. And put out clipboards. Wow. Uh, I'll walk the dogs, I'll drive you to treatment, I'll bring you fresh food, um, I'll prune your roses, I'll, you know, and people signed up, these were all young people, people signed up and they showed up, and we got a ton of attention, we got a lot of media attention, we got support from all the businesses there, and like, what's next, you know, and we did it, and little kids made, made cards for everybody that were in the hospital, wow. the the, the rock and roll guys all had little concerts to raise money for these families. Teenagers made food on Friday nights, which I thought was party night, but no. They adopted a family, and they would be there every Friday night, hanging out with this family, tutoring their children, you know, just being supportive. Wow. I mean, so that initial grassroots call to action community has taken on legs of its own. It has definitely grown. So with the view of the Golden Gate Bridge, health conscious women in wine, life was good. And yet there was a fear that existed of cancer among your peers. Is the fear of cancer everywhere? And is that fear probably more, more common than people realize? It's real. It's real. It creates a tremendous amount of anxiety. Every woman who goes for a mammogram is freaked out. You know, every man who goes for a prostate exam or, I mean, it's just like, what's next? And I think this is what's going on in our culture, whether it's the food, whether it's whatever it is. 
that we're trying to attribute the cause of cancer, it's, it's, it's almost outside of my realm. My realm is to support the people who have it and those who love and care for them. And that includes the children. You know, the stress that comes with cancer, the financial stress that comes with cancer is overwhelming. Yeah. And that's where it morphed into the next evolution stage for me when I was in treatment and um, talked to so many people who were also in treatment. And I'm a psychologist. I ask too many questions, you know, but the point is there, there's an immediate intimacy among cancer patients. They tell their stories. And these people were saying to me that the stress, that they didn't have the money to pay for their treatment, yeah. so they to choose between food on their table or the medications. They chose the food. They didn't tell their doctors they weren't taking the medications. I mean, it was so complex and it was so emotional. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an overwhelming time for anyone, not only them, but their family. I mean, it's safe to say the fear is warranted. The stats in 2022 say it's estimated that 1.9 million new cancer cases were diagnosed and 609,000 cancer deaths in the U.S. alone. It seems there are many who need their hands held and their hearts as they move through this journey. Do you think that why, is that why your nonprofit over the past two decades continues to grow? Yeah, sadly, it really does grow big. Big because there are so many of people affected and and it has um, I think my mission statement which is no one will ever go through cancer alone mm-hmm. it says a lot and that's where I'm coming from and that's because I do hold hands and hearts you know and I also provide resources that can deepen the healing process yep. through my website and that's how people find but- professionals who can just deepen their healing. There are many moving pieces in that, in, that, uh, in that chapter of a person's life that they have to take care of. I mean, we rely on the healthcare system to treat the cancer, but what about the many emotional, psychosocial, spiritual challenges that come with a diagnosis? Is that really where Nancy's List comes in? Absolutely. That's exactly what it is. I mean, so many people have said to me, because what my diagnosis was pretty lethal you know stage four ovarian is not when you want and people have always asked me like what did you do what did you do did you sit under some special tree in some special place and that's what healed you and i think what happened is my heart went wide open and i understood i've been trained in the psychology and the emotional control that we do have I couldn't control maybe my body other than doing what the doctor said, but I could control my emotional states. And I felt so grateful by the generosity of these strangers and by my friends and family and my A-team and all that. And I was so fortunate. And I think that's as much as, that's, that's such a big part of the healing process is the emotional yeah. components. And Absolutely. I wish doctors and everybody else would address them in the way my doctor addressed them. But it is essential that we take care of each other in, in that aspect. I mean, the last place you want to be is alone, under a tree, with no support around you. I mean, that's the worst case scenario. This community began locally, and now the reach is far beyond your local community. Now, not including just individuals, but families, care providers. Tell us about Nancy's Club. What is uh, that, and why was that something you wanted to start? I wish it were happening right now, but when I moved here, it just I could not, I could not get the energy that we had in, in California. There were two little children that came to me independent of one another. They were both twelve years old. One came in. I call her Susie. That's not her name. But her father had just died of cancer, and her mother was on her second or third round of breast cancer. And this little girl had been adopted by them from Mexico. And she said with tears down her face, "Um, if my mother dies, does that mean I'll be an orphan again and have to go back to Mexico? And that's just like, you know, my heart, okay. The next day, this little boy comes in who says, my mother's sick with cancer, my father's drinking like a fish. Tell me how to make him stop. I need your help because I think he's going to die and I won't have anybody. 
And I just said, this is too big a burden for these little children, you know, and put a club together, an adventure club. But these kids, every single weekend, had an adventure. And these, the, most of the kids had leukemia or brain cancer. But they formed a cohesive group that was just beautiful. They took care of each other. The parents, you know, looked after each other. It was very interesting. And we went on, and the city, in the, the, it wasn't really a city, the county that I lived in, Marin County, supported us beautifully. We got all kinds of equipment, people, tickets to everything in the world. They're at the Giants game. They're at the, part, the football. You know, they're everywhere. We took them. And but what they loved the most was, was sailing. And sailing in the bay in San Francisco is quite challenging. But they loved it. It was like this, they, I can do it, I can do it, you know. And it was one of my most favorite, wonderful things. I would love to help people duplicate that program everywhere in the country or everywhere. Because it, they had something to look forward to. They weren't just cancer kits. They, were, they, were, they weren't alone, you know. Yeah. And... They forgot about their cancer when they were sailing the boat, you know, they... What, what a beautiful club to duplicate really across the country. Through your programs, cancer patients and their loved ones, they find strength, courage, pleasure, and healing relationships. Have you yourself witnessed that healing power when one is connected to this larger community? And is that what... That was kind of the feedback is. What has been the response of those who have been part of the community? Those, the uh, patients who have survived cancer are very committed to helping other people. It's one of the things, and, and with the children, what I was told years ago from the parents is you're teaching them about philanthropy in a way that we never could. And so I think it stays with you, you know, and I think you they felt these little kids making valentines for all the kids in the hospitals in the Bay Area. You know, what a sweet thing. And they initiated it. And, you know, we work, what do you want to do? What, how can you help? And they come up with all these things. And they decorate the wards. They would do everything. And people would donate gifts to give to all these children several times a year. So I think these children got a really good feeling of what it felt like to go into that hospital holding gifts to give to children. Excellent. I mean, we're talking philanthropy in action. They're able to see it up close and personal like that. Very inspiring. Your website provides your story and stories of gratitude and stories of hope. But this is more than just stories. This is a resource for financial assistance in legal, technology, uh, medical, transportation, retreats, and so much more. Why is that important for you to make sure that you're you're really covering the bases, if you will? Because no one else is. <laughs> <laughs> when I first get through a list of uh, where people could get money, cancer patients could get money during COVID, which was very serious for a cancer patient. Nobody else had put together a listing. And it's all of a sudden, you know, it's like it's so obvious to me. They don't know where to go. And there was money. And yep. it helped them. But if, you know, I, I would love it duplicated. I would love more people doing this in their own communities. You know, and it takes a lot of work. There's no question about it. But it's, yep. um, I feel nourished by it. I think it's soul food for me. Yeah. I mean, you, you have the model that you did locally. You would love to see that model duplicated hyper-locally within each community out there. I mean, let's face it, the cost of cancer care in this country, it is appalling. Yet you share there are many foundations, corporations, nonprofits, and just ordinary great people who are committed to help make it more affordable. How do those people donate and get involved with your nonprofit? Ooh, that'd be lovely. Uh, there is a donate page on my website. I'd love you to put post or say the name of the website. And, uh, you know, we come, it's, it's, it's a very individual matter. Like somebody called a day and they said, okay, I want to start a children's club just like yours. But, you know, it's like you're going to need, you're going to need a lot of uh, connections. It's just, it took amazing connections to see 
how people would, would contribute, how rock stars would give up an afternoon and do a, a concert for these kids. You know, I mean, it's just so blessed. It was just <laughs> almost, you know, it makes me almost tearful because I was so happy to see these kids. We sent them all to camp in the summer together, to a free camp. Um, they had a blast. They were together. We did this for a couple of years, so they, they really became good friends and took took very interested. If Johnny didn't show up for something, where's Johnny? What do you know about Johnny? I still hear from some of these kids, and they're always thanking me for how much it meant to them. That is great. Speak. That is wonderful when the community comes together like that. I mean, not only a community for those facing cancer, but also for those who care for cancer patients to really introduce themselves. How do those professionals get involved? Well, what I set up, because I think that, that uh, their healing's mysterious. You know, it's not just going to happen in the hospital. It's going to happen on many different levels and very individualized. But I wanted to promote the people who are really doing the work, the healing professionals, and set up a directory, which is quite large and gets larger every day, of practitioners all over this country and other countries who have signed up, they've been invited to sign up and tell their story. And I write a profile about the work they do and who they are and their credentials and all this and contact information with the photo. and. We put it out there, and I work on this every single month. I add more and more names, and I uh, advertise it to the whole group. Yeah, and people can find the kind of acupuncturist they're looking for, or the kind of organization or retreat center or whatever. There's a lot of camps because I'm a real believer that the camps are great for these kids. And there's a huge listing of camps, and that you know I'm always wanting. I mean, I will have to tell you just a quick story, but the people who do these camps are just so amazing. I mean, these little towns, these little rural areas, and they come together as a town, and this is their project, is to create a summer camp for these kids. And they have the medical staff, everybody's volunteer, all the money's contributed, and they do a beautiful, beautiful job. And they want these kids to have a camp, a camp experience that they would otherwise never get. You have wonderful stories that you're able to express, and you do so right there on the website. Nancy, what began as a pain on your right side entered you into a world unknown to you. As you asked, what is stage five? That naive individual now helps anyone who is living with cancer to get the best outcome, physically and as well as emotionally. In your first speech, you said, it is going to take a village and I want to build a magnificent one. Is this building still rewarding for you? Yes. Yes. I think, you know, it's given me a whole sense of spirit and connection and amazing people. Amazing, amazing people. And what we can do together, you know, to, to heal some of the wounds, some of the heart, some of the losses, all this that we have to deal with. And coming together, we can do it, and we're doing it. And uh, it's a big community right now. You know, it's like 25,000 people have signed up. So that's large. Um, and still growing. And I just feel this is my contribution. This is my love letter to the universe for my, for my life. Absolutely. I appreciate you accepting the invitation for us to tell this story. It's an honor for me to introduce this out there to my viewers. Viewers, take a look at the bottom of the screen. You're going to see the website. On the website, you can read and raise your awareness and be inspired by many stories while you educate yourself on the many resources that her site provides. From diagnostic to cancer care support, you too can join this nonprofit call to action community. Once again, that is Nancy's list. So no one will ever go through cancer alone. This is Gary Atensu with CNTV, and if you don't know, now you know. <music>